Would you turn to the book of Luke, chapter 24. Did anybody see the Sunshine Coast Daily? And they had an Easter special, it must have been about 10 pages thick, and I thought I'll just flick through and see how much really is all about what Easter is really all about. And right at the back, tucked away on one little paragraph is, what's this all about buns and bunnies? If he was to come back today, the Lord would be in for a big disappointment. So here is probably 2% of this whole 10-page spread. So it's Luke 24, just while I'm giving you the introduction. And here's an item by Greg Bray. He's a writer. He lives up in Gladstone. Nearly 2,000 years ago, a man was nailed on a cross for asking people to be nicer to each other. Now, I want you to listen. And for some reason, we commemorate this event by eating our body weight in hot cross buns and chocolates. Now, before you start reaching for your sword to stab me, I do realise that Easter is all about something else. Well, I do remember that it's more than just a magical rabbit and coloured eggs. And I go back to my Sunday school days, he said. I found that there were four versions of Jesus. The first one was the Christmas Jesus. That's the tot in the cot. The Easter Jesus was the man who was hung on a cross. I remember the resurrection Jesus... He rose from the dead and then he left before anybody could get at him and do something else to him again. <laughs> do people really believe this? And finally, I do remember Jesus as a kid because I was brought up with Jesus as a swear word. Oddly enough, I've never heard anybody yell out Buddha or for Krishna's sake after stubbing their toe. Why do they do it to Jesus Christ? And eventually I have learned that Jesus is much more than this, much, much more. For starters, he had a lot to say about the religious establishment of his day, and I reckon if he came back today, he'd have a lot more to say about this religious establishment. But what's even more impressive, he managed to get his message across without Facebook, without a sponsor, without radio, and without TV, and he changed the world. In fact, if anybody's in America on, uh, tonight, uh, just turn into NBC and you'll see the movement that changed the world, and they've got the whole story about Christ. Apparently... This Jesus is coming back again fairly soonish, but this time he won't be near as nice nor as pleasant. Personally, I reckon if he did come back, he'd spend two days crying when he hears what's been said and done in his name over 2,000 years, as though he doesn't already know. And you just wait till the Lord finds out about the Easter bunny. Well, you can't blame him for getting upset, he tried being nice the first time, and look where that got him. <laughs> now, isn't that a mixed message? Half and half. Just recently I came across an article which said, Islam grew out of the corpse of a church that had forgotten who Jesus was. They spread across the top of North Africa because the church was so beset with heresies that when... Muhammad, who travelled with his father in caravans to give a, a bring goods and stuff to Israel, he met different Christians on the way, but nobody ever was able to tell him who Jesus actually was. And he met Montanists, who even said that Revelation hasn't finished, and why we could even get more prophets and more books. And guess what happened out of that? Muhammad got the information, and a church that was once powerful, thousands and tens of thousands of churches in northern Africa were taken in because they had heresies and falsehoods and they were just ripe for the plucking because they didn't know who Jesus was. The conquest of Islam was over in a very short time. It went up into Spain and then it tried to get into Europe. And we've forgotten about the battles at Hungary and Tours and France and eventually got pushed back. They tried again in the uh, Turkish Revolution and they're now trying again for a third time. But this time they changed their tactics. Instead of trying to conquer by the sword, let's conquer by immigration and by population. And so today, look at England. It has 70 separate Sharia law courts. And here they're trying to do the same. I spoke to somebody on uh, the weekend and they were saying, have we seen the worst of what Islam will do in this country? And the man who wrote this article said, I don't fear what Islam is going to do, but I do fear if the church gets away from its moorings and its roots.
And if it loses its foundations on who Christ is, we have forgotten and we'll be ripe for the plucking once again. Pastor Rod's been taking a series on basics and back to basics. And this will probably tie it to the most fundamental basic of all. So we go to Luke chapter 24. Rod read the story of the resurrection. I'd like you to imagine in Luke chapter 24 that you've been scattered and that if you appear in public, you're dead. So what these disciples are now going to do is they're going to run. Some are going to go up to Galilee in the north and two of them are going to go west towards the Mediterranean Sea. They're going to go about 60 furlongs, which has been lost on this congregation. I can see what's a furlong. I knew I was getting old when my daughter said to me, what's a halfpenny, Dad? And I had to explain it's half a penny, which is less than a cent. And when she said to me, what did it mean on the news when it said the burglar uh, was running away and he beat the police by 20 yards? And all she could see was this burglar hopping 20 fences. <laughs> 20 house yards. We had a long chat about imperial measurements. I kid you not, this is my daughter. She's in England, she can't stop me giving the illustration. 20 furlongs is about 10 miles. 6, 10 miles, depending who's giving the uh, location of the town. And so what they're going to do is go up into the high country, where it's hard to catch them. If you'd like to make a mental equivalent, you'd go up to Dulong, and then you'd hike up through Mullaney, then you'd go out the back roads. How many hills are out the back of there? How hard would you be to find? So we've now come to verse 13, Luke chapter 24. Look, there were two of them that same day going to a village called Emmaus, which is from Jerusalem, about 60 furlongs, 10 miles, probably 10 kilometres. When they talked together of all these things which had happened, it came to pass that while they were talking and reasoning together, Jesus came near and went with them. Now, you've got to remember that Jesus is not limited by distance. So did he do a shufti? We don't know, we're not told. But they're going away from Jerusalem, suddenly he appears beside them. And their eyes are held back and they don't know him. It's like Mary in the uh, garden. When she saw Jesus, she thought it was who? The gardener. When we're taking communion, you'll be looking at the picture of what happened to Jesus. I reckon if you saw Christ on the cross and then you saw him after his resurrection, you would hardly believe it was the same person. When we saw him, we did not recognize him. We hid our face from him. He was beaten and marred more than any man. I mean, that's an amazing comment, isn't it? And then to suddenly see Jesus in full glory would be a marvelous thing, wouldn't it? Has anybody got a photo of yourself at 22 when you are absolutely stunning? Can you imagine being resurrected to the appearance of what you would be like in the strength of all your humanity and all your vigor without any ma or scar, save what's on his hands and on his side. It must have been an incredible change, even if that was the only reason. So they couldn't recognize him. And he said, what are you talking about? And why are you so sad? And they said to him, are you just a stranger in Jerusalem? You've got to remember that Jews have come from everywhere all over the world for a Passover. Haven't you heard what's come to pass? And he said to them, what things? This is one of the few times in Scripture where you'll see the Lord do a snow job, so to speak. He deliberately asks them, what things? And they said, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a prophet mighty in word and deed and word before God and all the people. Our priests and our rulers delivered him, condemned him to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it would have been he who redeemed Israel. Can you hear the disappointment in the voice? What kind of Jesus have they got up here? It's a Jewish Messiah. He's going to come, kick the Romans out, take over the place and set up Israel as boss cocky in the world, getting rid of the Gentiles, getting rid of all the oppression. In fact, when the Old Testament rabbis read the Old Testament, they were so puzzled by the references to a Messiah who was going to win 
and the Messiah who was going to get uh, crucified and beaten, they didn't know what to do with Isaiah 53. So some rabbis actually invented two messiahs. One was Messiah ben Joseph, and the other was Messiah ben David. And that's how they tried to handle Remember we last week looked at two mountains of prophecy? And when they looked at the scripture, they could only see the tops of the mountains. They couldn't see a crucified Messiah in a Gentile age. And what I love about Easter is this. The chief priests and their courts made a decision to kill Jesus. But God reversed the decision and raised Jesus from the dead. So you're looking at the most magnificent reversal. Did anybody see that African gentleman, uh, American Afro gentleman, who's out of jail after 30 years because he was framed? Framed. And I won't go into the story, but can you imagine what he would feel like with his, after 30 years, his decision reversed? Here is the greatest reversal of a legal decision that's ever been made. Yet certain women came, verse 22. We were astonished when we went to the sepulchre. They found nothing, not his body. And they said they'd seen angels. And they said he was alive. And certain went to the sepulchre, some of us, Peter and John, but they didn't see him. And in this clip you'll see when we take communion, you'll see a picture of the shroud and the grave cloth. And suddenly it just goes, like air being let out of a balloon. Can you imagine the velocity of the resurrection body. One day you will have a body like that. You'll be able to come and go at the beck and will of thought. Somebody once said they saw angels ascending and descending from heaven with the speed of thought. What a fantastic thought. Makes light look old and tired. Imagine the Lord saying to you, go and fix up that mess on Mars where they left that lunar landing and that rocket and clean it up. And you're there. He appears to them and they don't recognize him. And one of the very few times Jesus ever used words of rebuke, but a fairly loving one, is verse 25. He said unto them, our King James says what? O oh, fools, foolish ones. It literally means oh, unreflectors, non-thinkers, people who have not thought about what's been said. Don't you realize that all the prophets have spoken about this? Shouldn't Christ have suffered and then gone into his glory? And wouldn't you like to be in verse 27? In front of you, you've got 10 miles, fairly hilly country. You'll get to the top of a hill and pause for rest. And so what would probably take maybe two hours, maybe three hours for a fairly vigorous person could end up being the best four hour Bible study you've ever had in your life. Can you imagine Jesus actually teaching you personally? Imagine standing beside the Lord. Now, by the way, what don't they have? I want you to look this way. They don't have this much of the Bible. They don't have a New Testament. All they've got is the Old Testament. And by the way, where are the copies? Where are they? Where are the copies of the Old Testament? Anybody tell me? In the synagogues? Wrapped up on scrolls? In the temple? It's, they're not rich enough to even buy a copy. So when Jesus appears to them and says who he is and all about the resurrection... What has he got to use? What's in the heart? For all their life, they've been brought up learning the Old Testament. Some of them, some of those rabbis were so learned. There was one guy uh, in the 16th century who was such a learned rabbi. He actually remembered all the first five books of the Old Testament off by heart. Now, if you've ever struggled with reading Leviticus, that's some memory, isn't it? And he's influenced Judaism right up to this day. But what they've got is in their heart. And so Jesus is now going to give an exposition of who he is, and he's going to go right through. Do you know that Jesus is mentioned in every book of the Old Testament in prophecy or shadow, except for Nahum and Habakkuk? And Habakkuk and Jonah, the three books. But even Jonah is a picture of Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, look, in the books, in the writings, in the Psalms, the poetry books, here is this amazing story of Jesus Christ. Wouldn't you like to have been there at that Bible study? How would you like to go through the Bible? If you like, pop online sometime and go www.jesusonly.org. No, that's not the heresy, it's just a website. And it goes through every scripture in the Old Testament that refers to Jesus. Fabulous stuff. 
Give me some feedback. Whereabouts in the Old Testament do you find Jesus being prophesied as resurrected? All of you can tell me about Jesus in the Old Testament from Genesis, couldn't you? The, the lamb. You could tell me about Isaiah 53, the servant that's crucified. Maybe a bit at the end of Isaiah 53. He shall give him a portion with the great. Anybody think of the scriptures? Whereabouts does it say that he's not going to get corrupted and that he's going to have a new body? And what I want you, while you're thinking about that, because we are Westerners, aren't we? We're now struggling because we know the New Testament better than the Old Testament. And it's very easy to be smart about resurrection if you've got this last part. It's a little bit harder to start working through where it's hidden in the Old Testament. What about Job? What did he say? I know that my Redeemer lives, and in the last day I shall stand, not in this present flesh. He said, but I'll see him in my flesh. And he gave a hint that he's actually going to be changed. Now, we all know Job died. So he's obviously got an insight about it. And all the way through the Old Testament, rabbis and godly men and women realize that when the Messiah comes back, He's going to change us. Now, one of the problems, and let me take a moment to kick you back 2,000 years. In the Old Testament and in the Old Testament world, none of them believed in resurrection in the sense that we do. And I, I want to go back a little further. Pagans didn't believe in resurrection. They were taught by Philo and Plato and all of those other guys I won't bore you with that the body was bad, and when you left this body, you went into a rarefied or glorified or spiritual existence, like a spook or a spirit. Remember when they, they said that they were afraid when they saw Jesus because they thought it was a spirit or a ghost. So there's a concept of some kind of spiritual form out there, but they don't know what it's like. And there's plenty of stories in the old pagan mythologies about heroes going back into Hades and rescuing the lovely lady or coming back with the sword or the ring or whatever it might be. But none of them think that when you get into the new life, you're going to get your body. This is peculiar to the Jewish faith and to the Christians. God is not embarrassed about your body. Anybody seen the program Embarrassing Bodies? The very title, <laughs> don't worry, don't waste your time on it. The very title says there's something wrong with the human body. And Paul calls it the body of humiliation, not because it's a bad thing, but because it's got to go through death. And why resurrection was such a shocking message to the pagan world is because they all believed that when you got out of this world, whether you're an Egyptian getting your, all your goods and gear and going into the new one, or whether you're a Greek going into the new world and becoming a hero, that you escaped from this body and you never saw it again. So when Jesus comes back again in a body... It's such a shock that on Athens, when Jesus is getting preached by Paul, and Paul is speaking to them, they said, what is this man talking about? Because they do not have a clue that a resurrection body is what God always planned for you as a human being. When Come back with me right to the start of the Bible. And that's why I think resurrection, we take it for granted because we're so smart because we got the last quarter. In the book of Genesis, God created... Animals, rocks, and pumpkins. He makes a rock. He spits out water. He makes water. By his word, he makes stars. And then he decides to make animals. And he makes an animal that's alive. It's no longer a rock, but it's made out of the same minerals that you find in the ground. And he says, this is an animal. And it's got the breath of life. And then he says, I'm going to make something else. And so he takes a rock and he takes an animal, slaps them together, and I'm trying to exaggerate slightly, and he makes a special creation that is, has life, animal life, but it has more than that. It has a spirit. And he makes man in his image. And he makes a woman, and he makes a man, and he breathes into them the breath, plural, of life. And he says, now I am planning for you to walk with me. Well, you know the story. You know that we went downhill, we turned away from God, and we lost our plan to rule over creation. We turned our back on God. And in the day that you eat thereof, dying you shall die. And so the death process starts. Adam lives for how many years? 900 years? Methuselah gives 969. 
And slowly the death process starts. God never ever intended that you should get out of this body and go to heaven, play harps and float on clouds. He intended that you, with all his creation, should rule over his creation in a resurrected body and in a perfect body. He's not an escapist. Now Rod said our destiny is heaven, but that's only for a short while. When you finish with an intermediate state, you come back to earth with Christ and you get a resurrected body and we're going to see God rule and reign on this earth. Somehow, in the midst of all this universe, on one tiny speck, God has made us unique. Never again will there be a crucifixion of Christ. Never again will there be the resurrection of Christ. It's once and once only. And in the book of Hebrews 9.27 it says, It's given unto man once to die and then the judgment. That's why I said last week, resurrection is wrong. Uh, sorry, resurrection. Reincarnation is wrong, but resurrection is right. Because what does reincarnation want you to do? It wants you to come back again. And if you're not good enough, come back again, maybe as an aunt. And if you're not good enough as an aunt, you'll come back maybe as your auntie. Or you might come back as something else or something else. Pardon me. And what is it? It's man's effort to overcome sin. But Jesus said there's only one way. And so when you look at this passage on resurrection, we as Westerners don't understand the impact that it had on the early church of that day, nor on the pagan culture. And yet it conquered the whole world. And so if you go to the book of Acts in chapter 13, you'll find when Paul is speaking to the church at Antioch, he gets up and he says, this is what God did in the past, but this is what he's done now. I found David, the son of Jesse. And he said, they killed him, and now they laid him on a tree. But God raised him from the dead. We take it for granted that resurrection is just a fact of history. I'd like you to start thinking about what resurrection means for you and your family and what Christ's resurrection means. It says Christ is the first fruits of the dead and then we that are Christ afterwards will follow him. Resurrection means that one day you're going to get a new body. And we had a bit of a chuckle about it a couple of weeks ago, didn't we? It says when the Lord comes back, he shall come in the clouds of heaven. When Jesus rose from the Mount of Olives, he was hidden by a cloud. A lot of commentators think that wasn't so much an earthly vapour water cloud, but a cloud of angels. In fact, it says in Thessalonians, when he comes back, he shall come back in the clouds of heaven with the holy angels. And when he comes back, he'll be in a resurrected body. And you are a hazard. You are a logistical problem to God. Let's imagine the Lord comes back in the next five minutes. What is he going to do with you? I know he's going to resurrect all the previous bodies, previous saints, but you are a logistical problem for the Lord. So he settled on a solution. He said, when I come back, first, everybody will be resurrected just like me. And you, what will happen to you? Is he going to kill you first? He's going to change you. And he comes with the most amazing solution that this world has ever heard of. If you had been on drugs, you could not come up with a more amazing story than what Jesus proposes here. He says, one day you shall have what everybody has wanted. Anybody read the old stories about the fountain of youth and the elixir and the alchemist changing things to gold? What is it in the human heart? They all want a golden age. In fact, somebody once said when I was reading through the history of the Nazi uh, regime, they said there's got to be a God if it only, and there's got to be a hell if only to punish guys like him. That was their philosophy. When Christ comes back, you'll be so changed... Now, would you take a moment to look at your friend or partner or spouse or person sitting beside you? Swing back, have a look. Now, when you see them and you're going up in the clouds to meet the Lord, coming back to reign on earth, you're going to see a person who is so different that you can hardly believe they're the same. No glasses, <laughs> new teeth, more hair, a body... That, and we laughed last time because when the Lord comes back, I said there'll be sudden be a flash and you can't change matter into nothing or energy into nothing. So where does thousands of kilos of fat go? Well, I don't know. Maybe it all gets desip like this. And everything that you've striven for for the last 20 years with your diet 
will suddenly be realized with no effort on your part. And you'll have a body like the Greek gods, quote unquote. You'll have a body that's just amazing. In fact, my mother-in-law was sitting here one time in church here and we were talking about it. And I said, Mari, do you realize when we get this glorified body, I'll turn to you and I'll look at you and I'm going to say, are you, were you really my mother-in-law? Let me give you a quote from C.S. Lewis. He said, if you could see the person beside you who doesn't know God and has left this life without God and is completely in the dark, if you could see what they would be like in 10,000 years, you would be so despairing, you would see such a person that is worse than the worst possible thing you can imagine in your nightmares. But on the other hand, if you saw a person in 10,000 years who loves God, who has so given their life to Christ that they are just full of light, you imagine what they're like. He said, if you could see them now, you would be tempted to fall down and worship them. Isn't that an amazing thought? And I'd like to wrap up just this simple comment on the resurrection with this, is that the resurrection of Christ is your guarantee. And when they heard what Jesus said, they didn't even stop having their meal. They rushed back 10 miles to go and see the disciples. How excited were they? And then they found a whole sequence of events. And it says in the book of Acts, and I'd like you to turn to that just in closing, if you go to Acts chapter 1. This is Luke writing. Luke is a doctor. He knows dead bodies. He's exhumed them. He's dissected them. And he knows when a body is alive. And so when he's writing these words, I want you to think like a coroner who knows what it means to see death and life. And he says this, I made a formal letter to you of all that Jesus began to do and teach. This is probably the book of Luke, the Gospel of Luke. But it's the same Luke who's writing. And he says, he was taken up, he was made alive through the power of the Holy Ghost. He gave commands to his apostles. And look at verse 3. He's now writing to a Greek who is going to be sceptical and who wants to know is what has been told true. Look at verse 3. Jesus showed himself alive after his passion, his death on the cross, by infallible proofs, things that would stand up in a law court is the translation. He was seen of them for 40 days. He spoke to them of the things pertaining to the kingdom and he said, now stay in Jerusalem till you are baptized in the Holy Spirit. When Luke wrote these words, when you go through the book of Acts, you're going to see resurrection all the way through. And Paul, who's the greatest disbeliever in this Jesus, is going to get converted and preach the resurrection of Christ. In fact, he even throws it in as a ploy between Sadducees and Pharisees. So you're looking at the greatest fact in history that stood before every law court and it's never been disproved and everybody who's ever tried to stamp it out and get rid of it has always had problems. In fact, one of the funniest things I think that's ever happened in history was the atheist Voltaire. Anybody heard of the French Revolution where they guillotined all the aristocrats? And today, France, uh, liberty, egality, fraternity, all of that comes from the French Revolution, which was godless. And Voltaire's great boast, you know what it was? He said, in 20 years' time, we will not need Bibles, we won't believe in God, and man will be his own salvation. Well... Voltaire has come and gone. And guess what Voltaire's house is today? It is used by the British and Foreign Bible Society to distribute Bibles. <laughs> You've got to say, God must have a little bit of a quirky sense of humour when he lets that happen. I think it's wonderful. On a wall in a tunnel just outside of university, just at the time when the German philosopher Goethe was um, preaching his God is dead stuff, one of these students in despair had written up on the wall, God is dead. A few years later, after the man who wrote this had died, another student came along and said, Goethe is dead, sign God. <laughs> Don't we take for granted the wonderful thing called life and the love that changes our life. So planned that it's written in the Old Testament, so absolutely proven that nobody's been able to disprove it, 
And the only people who don't want it are those who are pre-prejudiced and made up their minds that it's wrong. We come to the most wonderful fact in history, that Christ rose again. Now to conclude, every religious founder is dead. Only Christ is alive. And that's what makes him unique and makes us love him. We love him because he first loved us. And I want you, as you're going through the Old Testament and the New Testament, start to uncover the wonder of resurrection. It just changes your life. And one day when you think that you shall have a body like Christ's without the scars, that just boggles my mind. It's an amazing thought that you will be like him. Now, God didn't give you that privilege now. In fact, if God gave you a resurrection body now in your fallen state with your sinfulness, we would probably use it for wrong purposes, don't you think? If you were a criminal, you'd never get caught. If you were a godly person, you'd probably use it for good. Philip was found at Azotus. He was preaching there to Samaria, and suddenly, 10 miles away, he's preaching to the Ethiopian eunuch for good. But God didn't say you're going to have that at the moment. So, folk, I'd like you to think about what Jesus said when he said, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do it till the Lord comes. And I'd like our deacons to come forward and just with the power of that resurrection, scripture in your heart. Let's get ready to take communion. When I was a boy in Bible college, I was 20, naive, young and green. In fact, I just spoke to my Bible college uh, principal yesterday on the phone. He rang me up and said, thank you for coming to my wife's funeral. I don't know if any of you know Ralph Reed. Ralph's wife Iris passed away and we went to the service and he wrote back and I gave him a copy of a CD. It was called Rewarded by the Lord. And I said, Ralph, I just want to say thank you for what you did in my heart and in my life and how uh, Bible college really helped me. And I'd just like, as you take the cup and the bread, just hold them. And one of the other teachers in our Bible college was a lady called Irene Ricks. Irene was the uh, children's church educator of the day. And the first thing I heard out of Irene's mouth was this. Do you realize that birds sing in the minor key? I said, no. And she said, do you realize that pagan songs are in the minor key? Most pagan songs? I went uh, just recently to a service uh, with an Islam group. I went to the uh, fast that they do, Ramadan. And you know, I was struck by this. There was no joy there. There was no love for God because they're afraid of Allah. There was no singing. And this morning, when we came into our service, I remembered what Irene Ricks had said. Birds sing in the minor key. Creation groans in the minor key. But it took the resurrection of Christ to bring the major key. And when we sing, some of these songs that we've just sung, they're just amazing, and they're in the major key. And when we look at the crucifixion of Christ, for all its desperateness, we might do the house lights if somebody can just uh, take those off for us. If somebody who knows how to switch those off. Do you want to do that, Rod? Sorry, I'd have to ask. And as we take this cup and this bread, we look at just the amazing things that happened over Easter. But aren't you glad it didn't stop here? In fact, it's so graphic. Uh, last night, I just saw the tail end of Ben-Hur. Anybody remember seeing that film? And it shows Christ. And as he's on the cross, they show the blood going down to the ground. A storm hits, and the blood washes off the cross and puddles onto the ground and runs down through past the big old olive trees, and it changes creation. And it's, it's a wonderful way of Hollywood showing it. I just want you to reflect for a minute.